a reading from the book of Moses, the book of Exodus. And the people, seeing that Moses delayed to come down from the mount, gathered together against Aaron and said, Arise, make us gods that may go before us. For as to this Moses, the man that brought us out of the land of Egypt, we know not what has befallen him. And Aaron said to them, Take the golden earrings from the ears of your wives and your sons and daughters and bring them to me. And the people did what he had commanded, bringing the earrings to Aaron. And when he had received them, he fashioned them by founder's work and made of them a molten calf. And they said, These are thy gods, O Israel, that have brought thee out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it and made proclamation by a crier's voice, saying, Tomorrow is the solemnity of the Lord. And rising in the morning, they offered holocausts and peace victims, and the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Go, get thee down. Thy people, which thou hast brought out of the land of Egypt, hath sinned. They have quickly strayed from the way that which thou didst show them. And they have made to themselves a molten calf, and have adored it, and sacrificing victims to it have said, These are thy gods, O Israel, that have brought thee out of the land of Egypt. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Peace be to you, and welcome to this, our mission, climbing the mountain of God. I hope you receive many graces for coming this evening. Yesterday, we heard about the endpoints of the mountain of God, the pit, hell, the abyss. And we learned about the eternal reward for reaching the summit, which is we receive heaven, paradise. So we looked at the ends. We also heard something of the mountain itself. Tonight, we need to discuss what keeps us from climbing the mountain more quickly or even climbing at all, namely sin. Dante, he wanted to climb, but he could not because he had fallen into sin. Bartimaeus was blind due to sin, at least original sin. And he could not even start the ascent until our Lord healed him. And since the various particular sins are listed with some detail in that examination of conscience, I hope you all received one and have looked at it. Let us spend some time this evening discussing a few of the root causes of sin and maybe some of the trajectories that bring us from one sin to another and to another trajectories of sin as well as what to do about it now it seems to me this will prove more helpful to us in overcoming the smog of Jericho than going through each individual sin It will help us understand where the diabolical disorientation is really coming from. What's causing this disorientation? I want to know the causes. Well, let's start with sin. It's an, it is impossible, it's impossible to overstate the evilness of sin. God's hatred for sin is infinite. Sin is so bad, so hideous that only He can know what a detestable, horrible monster it really is. St. John Hughes, he says, Realize that sin is the cause of endless miseries, the source of all spiritual and temporal evils on earth, in purgatory and in hell. It has caused the damnation of countless souls. Sin is so great an evil that even the attaining of some benefit or good could never justify it. Would it not indeed be a marvelous thing to save all the souls on earth and snatch them from the jaws of hell? Yet, if to obtain such an end it were necessary to commit even the slightest sin, it would not be allowed. It would not be permitted. 
Know then that sin is an evil of infinite magnitude, horrible and detestable beyond description. It draws down upon men the anger of God. Let's put a bookmark there. That's our bookmark. We're going to talk about that. It draws down upon men the anger of God and earns for them eternal damnation. Only God can hate it as it deserves. Only he can know its hideousness. Only the blood of the Son of God can destroy its effects on men's souls. It can only be destroyed by the very destruction of a God-man. Wow. Sin is so bad that it can only be destroyed by the death of our Lord. Oh, how much then ought we to distest even the slightest sin, even the most tiny sin. No, we should never say, oh, it's just a little one. No. Sin is bad. We should hate all sin. And if this be true, then how important, how very important is this conference? Because if we can understand and grasp the causes of sin and see its trajectories beforehand, how much more easily will we avoid adding sin onto sin onto sin? How much better will we climb the mountain of God and overcome all the problems in our way? Now, the story I read to you in Exodus, amazingly, that we just heard, has all the various causes and trajectories on display for those who have eyes to see them. So let's look at this. The scene. Let's start with the scene. Moses is up on the mountain. There's that mountain theme in the Bible. Aaron and her and the Israelites are down in the valley. Once again, let's get oriented. One of the first requirements for eternal life is what? Knowing up from down. St. John the Baptist tells us, a man cannot receive anything unless it be given to him from heaven. A man cannot receive anything unless it be given to him from above. Hmm. St. James says, Every best gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no change or shadow of alteration. Now once, just to get the point across, there was his father and he had his son. And he decided he was going to take some of that juicy corn in the neighbor's field. So he trained his son, took him out, and he said, Now you look around, son. Look over there, and you look over there. Make sure nobody sees me, okay? Then the son said, Well, Dad, shouldn't we be looking up? We are being watched, you know. Well, there was this store once. People were stealing all kinds of stuff. And they decided that if they cut a hole in the ceiling and put a glass plate over it, maybe a darkened glass plate, that, and then they'd let it be known, we're going to be watching from now on in this store, that everybody stopped stealing, and they did. This was before Walmart and had all those little cameras, you know, those little globes, hundreds of them. People stop. That's it, isn't it? When we look up, we stop sinning. There's something we can do about sinning right there. Keep looking up. Now, what is Moses doing up there? Well, he's looking up and he's receiving from above, from God himself, the Ten Commandments. Now, these commandments are the very heart of the old law and were so important that God commanded that it be stored in a golden ark. And this golden ark would be to put inside the Holy of Holies in the tent, which ultimately would become the temple. It was supposed to be in the holiest place on earth. It's pretty important stuff that's going on up there then. Now, this was all done in prefigurement of the new covenant where Jesus Christ, he's the new covenant. He was put in the living and loving ark, which is our lady. He became incarnate in her womb. That's why we say in the litany of Loretto, ark of the covenant, pray for us. Well, what is the nature of this law that was given to Moses? What are these commandments? Well, these commandments are about how man is made and what he must do to to be perfect and to be holy and to please God. They are permanent and they're enduring. That's why God wrote them on stone tablets. These came from the Father of lights, from with whom there is no change or shadow of alteration. He made us like this from the beginning, in other words. 
These commandments go back to the beginning. They were known and lived since the time of Adam. So, in other words, adultery, murder, these just didn't suddenly become outlawed with Moses on the mountain. Okay, these were always wrong. They are, as it were, written in the very heart of man from his creation. This is why we call them the natural law. They're part of our nature. They're based on man's nature, which has not changed from the very beginning. But it's fallen, yes, but we're still humans. We didn't change into something else. So in summary form, the natural law is none other than the Ten Commandments. So if you ever were someone to ask you, what's the natural law? Well, that's the Ten Commandments. That's the natural law. And if you're an engineer or you're going to build something and you have to, you have to in, supply an instruction sheet. You'd say, do this to make it run smoothly and don't do this uh, to, prevent it, to prevent it from blowing up. And that's what the Ten Commandments are. Do this and don't do this sort of thing. It's God's instruction sheet to make our lives run smoothly and to avoid a breakdown. Now, truly, this law is natural law. That means it's naturally knowable. We can figure it out. But after living in Egypt, the Israelites became more and more conformed to things of this fallen world. They became worldly. They became Egyptian. They became secular. Not only that, since sin causes spiritual blindness and stains the soul, darkens the intellect, we get confused. Can't see clearly. And so the Israelites could no longer discover the law written on their heart without great effort and much time. And they didn't have time. Recall Dante. Remember, he's down in the valley at the very beginning. What was his frame of mind? Remember that? Sleepy. He was reeling. He was confused. He was disoriented. He was in no state to discern the natural law. He needed it to be given to him from above. So he's in no shape to be uh, figuring things out. And God did help Dante through Virgil. Well, God gave Moses to the Israelites, which really prefigured that he would give his only begotten son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to his bride, the church. Now, when the fathers and the doctors of the church reflected on the natural law, they perceived them to be hierarchically arranged. They're listed in order of importance. They're not just randomly put on there. It's not by chance they're listed in this order. Now, this makes sense. You know, we look at all creation. It's arranged. It's hierarchical. We have minerals, right? We have plants. Plants are better than minerals. They're alive. Then you have animals. Well, they're better than plants. They can walk around and see things. Then you have human beings. And you got angels. See, there's a hierarchy. That's how creation is. It's hierarchical. There's hierarchy in us. Our souls are more important than our bodies, are they not? My heart's more important than my hand. My intellect and will's more important than the lower part of my soul. You see that? There's hierarchy. So God gave us two tablets. The first one is dedicated to our relationship with God and the other to our relationship with our fellow man. Thus, traditionally, the first three commandments are listed on the first tablet and the remainder on the second. Both tablets can be summarized as love of God and love of man. Okay? Both tablets can be summarized. Love of God, vertical. Love of man, horizontal. What do you do when you put the two together? You get the cross. This is taking up our cross, following the commandments. The law is ordered. It's hierarchical. This is part of the nature of things. Very important principle. Because it's being attacked everywhere today. We're being told everything's equal. No, everything's flat. No, there's hierarchy. They don't want you to look up. If you accept there's hierarchy, you start looking up. Because hierarchy makes you look up, see. Once again, this means that commandments themselves are listed in the order of importance or gravity. In a sense, the higher ones already contain the lower ones. 
The most important of all the commandments, therefore, is the first one. I am the Lord your God. You shall not have strange gods before me. So this means basically this. If I fully embrace the first commandment, then none of the others would really be necessary, would they? Because the highest one contains all the ones below. If you love God, really love him, you wouldn't worry about those other commandments. What did St. Augustine say famously? Love God and do what you will. Love God and do what you will. Because if you love God, you'll do whatever he wants. That will be what you will. And it'll always be good. When we truly love God, we will only do what is pleasing to him in everything. When we love God, the commandments just come naturally. We become like a ten-string harp that David mentions in the Psalms. We become sweet and beautiful music, both in the sight of God and man. So what the saints were. They're like harps, harps of God. But when we violate the commandments... Harmony is lost and lives become discordant with much suffering and death to follow. So now we are now in a position to to learn an important principle. It's a very important principle. If we worship God properly, which is to say we worship him the way God shows us to worship him. What's going to happen? He will protect us. He will enable us to keep the rest of the commandments. But if we fail in our worship of God, then we enter onto a trajectory of sin. If you fail in the first commandment, it's not going to be long before you're going to fail in all the commandments. People who go to Sunday Mass don't become mass murderers. They don't become grave criminals. They faithfully go to Mass and adhere to the teachings of the church by going to Mass They don't become criminals. I've met people that are in their 90s that cannot remember committing a mortal sin because they went to Mass every single Sunday. You're like, wow, that's awesome. It's possible. And they adhere to the church's teaching and embrace it. They just didn't go and check their little, little card. Click, okay, I went to Mass. No, they love God. But if we fail in our worship of God, then the rest of the commandments start to fall away very quickly. Cain, the first murderer, he failed in his worship of God before he turned to murdering Abel, his brother. Isn't that not true? It's in the Bible. Cain. Whenever the Jews of the Old Testament, they falsified the true liturgy that was given to them from above, they soon gave in to killing their children as well as the prophets that God sent them and ultimately, eventually, They killed the Son of God Himself because they falsified the liturgy of God. Now, to ensure that these commandments were obeyed, God revealed them many of other laws around this Ten Commandments. He revealed many other laws to surround them, such as social, judicial, ceremonial, and liturgical laws. Now, these added laws acted like an intricate immune system to protect the Ten Commandments. That was to help the Israelites keep the Ten Commandments. Now, these added laws were not arbitrary, but they were like determinations of the natural law, fitting for that time and place for these people coming out of Egypt. But they also acted as types and prefigurements of the future covenant to be revealed in Jesus Christ. Now, this is why the law of Moses included the ark, that was Our Lady, the priesthood, which was ultimately a type or a prefigurement of the priesthood of Christ in some way, and the tent with all its parts, such as the altars, the sacrifices required to keep man from sinning and to help him recover from sin was symbolic of the Mass in various ways. Now, why was such an immune system needed? The Israelites had just come forth from Egypt where they lived as slaves, not just slaves of hard labor, but slaves to sin, sinful ways of Egypt. And this touches on why God kept Moses on the mountain for so long. So there's two reasons at least why he kept him up there. Okay, number one, the immune system that the Israelites required was intricate. So it took some time to let it all out. 
to inform Moses. You think about it. The, uh, uh, intricate immune system wasn't required for Abraham or Noah before him or Jacob or Isaac. It was because they came out of Egypt. That's why it was so intricate. Their, <clears throat> their love had grown cold. But also it was important to keep in mind that Egypt was a highly advanced technological society. This is very important for us today to understand. Egypt is like the most technologically advanced society of the time. This is very important for us because we live in a highly advanced technologically society. Now, you look back at Egypt. They had built these pyramids. We still marvel at them today. In fact, people marvel at them so much that they posit that no man could possibly build those things. So aliens came from outer space and built those. Because only the people in the 20th and 21st century are smart enough to put something like that together. They're too stupid back in those days. See how arrogant we are now? It's terrible. They think that they were too dumb to do that, so they have to posit aliens from outer space to put those together. Well, they had also in Egypt a strong political system where they were feared by all those that surrounded them. They were powerful people. Great defense system. They also were licentious. And they knew how to sterilize. They also knew how to prevent childbirth by using IUDs. And apparently they were in the shape of a snake. And you know what? That technology still is with us. And it's exactly the same shape. The shape of a snake. They kill little babies in the womb. All IUDs kill Now, does this not sound familiar in a word? Egypt was very attractive, very alluring to man's fallen nature, very much like our own time. Egypt has come back with a vengeance. It is so hard then, is it really that hard to see why the Israelites kept looking back and longing for the flesh pots of Egypt? So in other words, the deeper the sinfulness, the more it had a grip on these people, the more intricate the immune system that was required. And that... Egypt had a grip on these Israelites because it was so uh, in union with their fallen nature. Now, the second reason for the apparent delay of Moses, that's the first reason, intricate immune system. Second reason was God wanted to show those people down in the valley, those Israelites, just how infected they really were, how hard their hearts really were, how much Egypt was still had a grip on them. He wanted to show them how much they needed to embrace the immune system if they were going to be saved from their own blindness and heart of heart. Okay, so let's think about it. The Israelites, they had just passed through wondrous events at the foot of the mountain. All right? Their memories were filled with the wonderful events of the ten plagues, the parting of the Red Sea, the destruction of Pharaoh's army, The crossing of the Red Sea symbolized their baptism. Their sins were wiped clean. In addition, they had the manna every day from heaven on a, you know, coming out of the heaven, the the bread of angels. They had the water from the rock, the pillar of fire, the cloud. Before being called back up the mountain for 40 days, Moses even wrote down the Ten Commandments. They weren't in stone yet. But he wrote them down for them and left them at the bottom of the mountain. He sprinkled them with blood from the altar. And they agreed to follow the commandments. And although they had all these things, the people grew weary and restless, waiting for Moses to come down from that mountain, shrouded in a mysterious cloud. What was the disastrous result? Using their highly advanced Egyptian way of thinking, what did they do? They decided to make their own God, form their own liturgy, and live by a new man-made morality. That's what they did. So let's pause here a moment to ponder on the fact that a similar situation has developed in our own day. And this may sting a little. Are we so different than these poor Israelites? Let's see. We have the fulfillment of the Red Sea in our baptism. We have the true bread from heaven daily in Holy Communion at the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. 
We have the red pillar of fire in our sanctuary lamps, showing us the real and abiding presence of our Lord Jesus Christ in our tabernacles. We have the most blessed Virgin Mary, the living Ark of the Covenant, assumed into heaven. Now note that this is something that the Israelites did not yet have. Key point. That ark was still being revealed to Moses on the mountain. They did not have the ark yet down below. Okay. Maybe that's why they failed. But we've got the ark in superabundant fulfillment in the Blessed Virgin Mary. We also have wonder upon wonders in the lives of the saints. We have all the things the church did to build Western society. In recent memory, we have the miracle of Fatima. Once again, you have to go back to the Bible to find a miracle of equal proportion. We have the stigmata, Padre Pio. We have saints that lived only on the Eucharist, even in recent memory. We have miracles that are still being worked this very day through the sacraments. Many priests experience miracles through the anointing. Yet we too grow weary. Love seems to have waned while we wonder where our Lord is or will he ever come back down again from the clouds from above alas most catholics this stings most catholics today are basically no better than those living in jericho or egypt with the rates of divorce rates of abortion the use of contraception and sterilization the acts of impurity being about the same for those inside the church as for those on the outside That's a frightening fact. What does this mean? Catholics are more and more accepting of the various perversions of Jericho. Jericho is the home of revolutionary men. It's pumping out all sorts of sounds, information and misinformation and vice. And those who lend their ears to it become enslaved to it. How fitting that the golden earrings of the Israelites became their golden calf. So let's think about this for a moment. Do we watch TV? Do we watch movies? Do we listen to modern music? Do we read popular books? Do we surf the web? Now it seems that we are breathing in the air of Jericho in these things. I'm not exaggerating. I'm not being rigid. It's true. That's how Jericho is spreading its smog through these means. A lot of confusion. How easily we are infected with the smog and confusion of Jericho through these modern means. In a word, it means that Catholics have gone secular. Think about it. When I watch TV, do I get any merit for watching TV? No. Is there any indulgences for watching movies, even good ones, Catholic ones, they say? No. No. Is there any merit for watching one of those? No. Am I redeeming the time that God is giving to me when I watch one of those? I don't think so. But what does this mean but that our immune system is not functioning properly? If all the people in the church are basically doing the same things as though outside the church, something's wrong with the immune system. This subject in itself is a whole other conference, but it is sufficient to say that the church today and all her faithful members are going through a passion. You've probably heard this before, but you think about Jesus Christ. He's in his his ministry on earth from Cana all the way to Palm Sunday, even after a little bit. People tried to kill him. He walked right through them. They tried to do things to him. He went right around them. Nobody could touch him. He had an immune system that was unbelievable. But after the passion got started, they could have their way with him. They could beat him and punch him and spit on him and crown him, scourge him, crucify him. I think the immune system of the church isn't working. Sister Lucia said, as these times are of diabolical disorientation, we're in an agony in the garden with betrayal and scandal of our own clergy. 
We were being scourged at the pillar and crowned with the thorns by the media and the various governments. We we're being forced to carry heavy crosses of guilt and shame. Taking more and more courage today to be Catholic. Many of the people who call themselves Catholic are in high positions in the government and betraying us every single day. We're in a passion. The immune system isn't working. Many approved mystics and messages from heaven have predicted this crisis. The church is following her bridegroom and head, Jesus Christ, to Calvary. Listen to Pope Pius XI. These are powerful words. He says, the expiatory passion of Christ is renewed, underline that word, and in a manner continued, underline that word, and fulfilled, underline that word, in his mystical body, which is the church. So the expiatory passion of Jesus Christ is renewed, is continued, is fulfilled, and it's, being ha- it's happening in our presence now. This means that we can no longer afford to just be average Catholics, but must defend ourselves and know our faith and know it well. We have much that the Israelites did not have. They failed miserably because they did not yet have Jesus living in Mary, in the ark. Symbolized by the stone tablets in the ark in the Old Testament. Now, they did not have an established altar and daily sacrifice. We do. We've got this. We have no excuses. And we know the Catholic Church will never fail, but we have neglected her and all the wonderful means that God has given us through her. This is the passion. So let us return then to the mountain of the Exodus and see how now, this is important, how the Israelites failed because this touches directly why the church is on the way of the cross today. As we mentioned, the Israelites down in the valley were imbued with errors of Egypt such that they turned away from God by making their own God, golden calf, made their own liturgy, had an altar there, proclaimed a feast day, and their own morality. They ate, they drank, and they got up and they played. The lion of pride was present to encourage them toward self-determination. Okay, now here's a very important point. We've got to get this through our head. When man, giving in to this pride of self-determination, he's got to turn away from God. And he turns away from God, he's got to find something on which to base his new system of belief and morality. He's got to find something to base his system on. What's that going to be? If they're not going to look up, Where are they going to look? Well, you can look around or you can look down. What are the chances of looking around versus looking down? Well, he's going to look down. That's how man is. So they start looking down. So what did they do? Well, they made a golden calf and they elevated it to the level of a god. Remember our hierarchy? Animals are lower than man. They're taking an animal and they're elevating it to be a god. You see that? That's what's going on there. Now, let me just rephrase this. They perceived things as rising from below. I'm going to repeat that. They perceived things as rising from below. This is the same theory, the same philosophy that is being promoted today in almost every single aspect of our lives. It is called in a word, popular word today, evolution. Evolution is basically a philosophical system that sees all things as going from a lower order to a higher order. Lower order to a higher order. Let me give some examples. It affects everything, okay? It's not just animals and our origins. How about cosmology? There's such a thing they call this theory which is really stupid, but it's called the Big Bang, right? You know that. Everybody's heard about the Big Bang. Now, they're saying that this bang outcomes a 
intricately ordered universe that's beyond our understanding. The more we learn about it, the more we're like going, wow. And you're going to tell me that uh, an explosion produced this? All right. Let's go to Hiroshima. I dropped a bomb there, right? The United States. What came out of that? Twisted metal and a whole lot of death. Did you see any order come out of that? When you want to build a house, do I go put a bunch of TNT there and go and blow it up? And that that'll put me into a house. Doesn't make any sense, does it? You don't bring order out of disorder. It doesn't make any sense. That's being told you that's the truth. How about, we all know this one, biology. You have evolution of species. You come from a one single cell species that's built over millions of years and finally it gets into a human being. Lower order to a higher order. You see that? That's evolution. So for the Israelites in the desert so long ago, and for us today, it seems to me the answer for what people base their convictions upon is the same. Evolution. And this is the source of much confusion and diabolical disorientation in our world today. And you're thinking, Father, I don't believe in evolution. Hang on. I think you might be surprised. Now, what does the world say in our times in a thousand different ways? There's no up, there's no down. All is relative. All is revolving, all is evolving, including our morals. Progress, progress, progress. That's our world today. All is just evolving. Nothing's fixed. Now, this is very serious. Consider this as an example. I already brought it up. Dropping of these bombs. Consider President Harry S. Truman. He made his decision to drop the atomic bombs on Japan. He was touring the burned-out neighborhoods of Berlin. And while attending the summit with Churchill and Stalin on how to divide Europe. So here he is walking through burned-out Berlin. And he gets word, oh, the bombs work. Okay. And this is what his response was, quote, I fear that machines are ahead of morals by some centuries, and when morals catch up, there will be no reason for any of it, close quote. Now, note the evolutionary view of Truman, the evolutionary view of morality. He was a Freemason, proud of it. Now, he then ordered the bombs to be dropped. Because there wasn't any morality around to help him make a good decision. He didn't look up by consulting the church. Now we have a Moses in the Pope and the morals he needed were available. According to a recent biography of Pope Pius XII by the American diplomat Harold Teitman, the Pope asked Roosevelt and the other heads of state to avoid indiscriminate bombing even before the war began. And he repeated his request throughout the war. He was writing them letters all the time. Please do not use indiscriminate bombing in this. Please don't do this. Please don't do this. Here's the reasons. This later was put in writing and found its way into the catechism. And it says, Every act of war directed to the indiscriminate destruction of whole cities and vast areas with their inhabitants is a crime against God and man, which merits firm an unequivocal condemnation. Hmm. Now, have we a difficult moral dilemma? Look up. How are we going to look up? Well, we consult the church, her doctors, her fathers, her councils, her traditional disciplines and teachings, and we will find the solution before opening those Bombay doors. She alone has the answer that is from above. She alone has the answer that leads to the summit. Now, what does this evolution really come from then? Where does it really come from? Does it come from Darwin? No, it does not come from Darwin. He just popularized the evolution of species. It doesn't come from him. Well, he, you know, he, he, he popularized it in regards to species coming from a lower order to a higher order such that man is said to have come from a lower order species, as we said already, as from monkeys and apes, which is silly. Now we ask, does this philosophy come from facts gathered by scientists and other great thinkers? No. 
Many professed evolutionists, and here I'm speaking of professors and Nobel Peace Prize winners like Sir Julian Huxley, they admit it in their more candid moments. And you can find these quotations. I'm not going to read them, but I'm just going to tell you what they say. That ev essentially evolution is a system requiring pure belief since authentic scientific evidence has yet not been found, has yet to be found to support this theory. So, in fact, it runs directly counter to many philosophical and physical principles like the second law of thermodynamics. What's that? Well, that just says that things are in a state of decay. Entropy, noise, chaos is always increasing, not decreasing. Things go from a higher order to a lower order in nature. This building is falling apart. It was brand new once. You are falling apart. So am I. So true science says things devolve, not evolve. Things devolve. True science says things change, but not into other things. So now looking up, let's get some, let, let's do what we just said. Let's look at the church. Let's look at our councils. Let's look at our doctors. What, what, what do they say about this? Let's look at the authoritative teaching of our infallible church. Ladder in four. 1215, this teaching is a creed, meaning it has a very high level of infallibility, ordinary infallibility. This is repeated by Vatican I in 1870, this teaching. It says, we believe God immediately from the beginning of time fashioned each creature out of nothing, spiritual and corporeal, namely angelic and mundane, and then the human creation composed of both spirit and body. End quote. Let's look at that. Each creature was created from nothing immediately. From the beginning of time. Not one species from another over hundreds of years and centuries, whatever. Where does evolution fit in here? It does not fit. It must be rejected. It's an attack on our faith. Listen to the German bishops. They answered Darwin at the Council of Cologne, 1860. This is what it said. This is what they said. Quote, Our first parents were formed immediately by God. Therefore, we declare that those who assert man emerged from spontaneous, continuous change of imperfect nature to the more perfect is clearly opposed to sacred scripture and to the faith. End quote. Listen to a creed composed for the profession of our Catholic faith by Pope Pelagius I. This is way back in the year 1560 or 560, sorry. Here's what he said. For I confess that all men are from Adam, even to the consummation of the world, having been born and having died with Adam himself and his wife, who were not born of other parents, but were created the one from the earth and the other, however, from the rib of man. Listen to Pope Leo the Thirteenth. This is after Darwin. He says, "We know what we record. What is known to all, we record what everybody knows, and cannot be doubted by any. That God, on the sixth day of creation, having made man from the slime of the earth, and having breathed into his face the breath of life, gave him a companion, whom he miraculously took from the side of Adam when he was locked in sleep." God thus, in his most far-reaching foresight, decreed that this husband and wife should be the natural beginning of the human race. Hmm. Consider how our Lord Jesus Christ spoke of this in the Gospels. He, he, he spoke about this. He knows what he was talking about. This is the Son of God, the Word incarnate. Now, in a question on marriage, he said, From the beginning of creation... God made them male and female. Mark chapter 10, verse 6. From the beginning of creation, not hundreds and thousands of years. From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Quotation, our Lord Jesus Christ. In his warning to the Pharisees, he mentions how Abel was slain from the foundation of the world. Quote, that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation from the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias who was slain between the altar and the temple. Now the fathers of the church tell us 
that the foundation of creation, the foundation of the world is creation, not billions of years later. Also, the genealogy in St. Luke's gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ says that Adam was of God. There was no apes in between. Let's put that to rest. So where then does evolution really come from? That's why I'm going to all this trouble. The answer lies a little lower, as some of the most famous evolutionists boldly admit. Namely, that the real reason for this belief is that it releases man from a morality based on God and his creation. Most especially in regard to the sixth commandment. What is more, others admit that they simply cannot bear the alternative, namely that God made us. They're very much like those Israelites at the foot of the mountain. The evidence of God's presence is all around them. They're actually under the cloud, pillar of fire. It's all right there in their face. The fact that God's presence is all around us, all over. They refuse to see it. And yet they insist on forgetting God, their creator, just like those Israelites. So their system, their system is not based on faith and reason looking up, but on passion looking down. So if I'm going to look down, what am I going to look at? Passions. My body. The passions are always passing. They're always moving. They're in turmoil. That's why they're called passions, because they come and they go. And unless they're conquered by God's grace, they will continue to be passing. Now think about it. Man is a microcosmos of the universe. He's a microcosmos of the macrocosmos. And this means that his worldview comes from what he thinks of himself inside. See where evolution comes from? Not Darwin, but from our fallen nature. Whereas the unchanging God wants to give us peace and order, what's his word to us? Be still and know that I am God. Evolution gives us motion, action, passion, struggle, strife, unrest. I'm telling you, evolution is a passion-based system. And I'm telling you, it's touched every aspect of our lives. It's very dangerous. Think about this. No wonder then the evolutionists, we're going to talk about how it affects our lives. I hope I can get to it. No wonder then the evolutionists abandon the truth that we're made in God's image and embrace a silly Egyptian idea that we somehow come from the lower beasts. Where does this lead? To an inversion of hierarchy. Animals are given equal or even more rights than men. Like seeks like, right? According to them, evolutionists, since we all come from one organism, it's speciesism to claim man's superiority over the animal kingdom. Many couples call their dogs, their children, and even a Florida woman married a dolphin. What's going on? This is evolution. This is Egypt at work. This is the lion of pride, making the world fit our own fallen ideas and desires and our, emo our imagination at work. It can go wild. I can marry a dolphin. And they go do it. And our country has reached to the point where they let her. Wouldn't we lock somebody like that up some years ago? This is Egypt at work. This is the lion of pride. In the desert, the Israelites took this to the level of worship. As you can see in a real way, they were not worshiping a golden calf as their God. They were worshiping their own passionate fallen human nature. That part of our nature that we share with the animals. We're called rational animals. 
We have something in common with the animals. We're microcosmos of the macrocosmos. We have something of the animal in us. It's to be governed by reason and faith. But how can I make this claim about what I've just said about their making this animal their God, their own passionate nature? Well, let's go to the book, the, the, the Bible again. Let's go to the Psalms 105. They made a calf in Horeb, and they adored the graven thing. They changed their glory into the likeness of a calf that eateth grass. Psalm 105. So man's true glory comes from being made in the image and likeness of God. We know that. That's where our glory comes from. Being made in the image and likeness of God, we must receive our liturgy, our morality from above. To fulfill that image and likeness. But this was too much for one so wedded to the world and imbued with the revolutionary Egypt-like ideas. It was too contrary to our fallen nature. Too mysterious, too vertical, too hierarchical, too filled with awe. So by worshiping a calf, the evolution-crazed Israelites were saying, we are made in the image of beasts and we are therefore like the beasts. And God said, do you want to be like the beasts? Go ahead. Now, perhaps they also knew that Moses was going to come down. And when he came down, what was going to be the result? Purification, mortification, penance. They were going to have to do some detaching. It was going to be painful. They were going to have to get Egypt out of their hearts because they knew Moses would bring it out of their hearts. What they really wanted was Moses to come down the mountain, that mysterious high altar with all that incense, And they wanted him to come down and serve them according to their fallen nature. That is, according to their animal instincts and desires. Thus, by the way, this happens to priests all the time. This is what I'm saying. This evolution is everywhere and it affects us. Happens to me. I know it's happened to other priests. People want you to come down. Come on, Father, come and party with us. Come down, Father. Get off that high altar up there and be like us. Instead, a good priest is constantly trying to get you to come up. to Get away from all that wicked stuff. To climb out of that valley because your salvation is in risk. It's in danger. See, that's that evolution at work. It's an inversion of hierarchy. We start looking down on the priest as if we have something to look down on. No, no. He's above us. He judges us. We don't judge him. And he's judged by his bishop. He doesn't judge him. You see how that works? Anything else is evolution. Flipping over. It's all over the place. It's causing all kinds of disorientation. Well, what happened to those people down there? They were going to make ready for Moses' return by forming their own pseudo-man-made religion to match their desires, forcing Moses to accept it as Aaron did. Against Aaron, they used democracy. They presented him with a petition. Hey, Aaron, we want a God. You make us one, okay? And there was her standing right next to him. If you read the Bible, her disappears at this moment. We no longer find him ever again. What happened to her? He said, you're not going to do that. And they took out their swords and they went through him. We're going to do what we want. Her's dead. That's a tradition. He was killed. He resisted. Aaron said, oh my goodness, okay, I'll make you a golden calf. No problem. Hope Moses comes down soon. So Moses would just have to go along with the democratic rule as Aaron did or face the same fate her did. Now in the passion, that's the liturgy. They got their own little liturgy, their little altar, little celebration going on. They gave their own liturgical situation. Now, in the passion of the church, this is going to sting, at least for some, in which we're currently living. Has evolution touched our liturgy? I think we need only look around. Altars are moved from the head. The church is built in the shape of a cross to imitate the body of Christ. And the altar is in the head. And they moved it down. Where did they move it to? Many churches, it's moved all the way down into the body. What are they saying by that? What's going on there? It symbolizes that the Mass is more of an emotional experience now. 
It's passion. We gotta feel something. We gotta get something out of it. We have to have music and an environment in which people can say, wow, I really got something out of Mass today. I feel like I got something out of it. What did God say? Be still and know that I'm God. If I go to different masses around the country, what do I find? Something different. I go to different dioceses that have different policies. You stand here and you don't stand there and you kneel here and you don't kneel here. I look in the pews and I find all these song books and the words change from song book to song book. Get new lectionaries every so often, new scriptures every so often, new missiles every so often, and they keep changing. I go to this church and I hear this about how Jesus didn't know who he was until he was baptized by John. I go to this pulpit, he didn't know who he was until he was in the temple. Everywhere you go, there's something different. Modern churches are now built in the shape of a round. And they're not built up to the altar. They're built down. Don't you see? This is painful to say. Evolution has touched our liturgy. Evolution has touched nearly every aspect of the world in which we live. What about the moral system of the Israelites? Since man evolves from beasts and is made in their image, he should do what the beasts do. Follow any and every desire. What do calves do? They give free reign to their appetites. And so did they. After worshiping the calf, the evolution embracing Israelites sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. This is a polite way of saying they committed all sorts of sins against the sixth commandment. They gave free reign to gluttony and lust. They saw no need of purification. Once again, evolution is a passion-based philosophical system. It's based upon the animal part of man. These passions are the very fuel that keep the fires of Jericho pumping out smog. It's the fuel of revolutionary men. And where revolution goes, it will go. And wherever it goes, revolution will go. Inversion of hierarchy. Disorientation. Passions will be unleashed. This is a major cause of sin today. A sign of its presence is that the major motivation of our actions is that we want to feel good. Now, when you're a confessor, when you're studying morality... You know that someone is sinning because that's what's leading them to sin. They want pleasure. It's a mistress. If ever pleasure is a mistress to our actions, it's a sign you're sinning. God gave pleasure with certain actions to be concomitant. They go together. As you're doing the action, it will feel good. But you're not letting that feel good lead you to do that thing. So first and foremost, we should have reason be our king and lead us to do what is right and wrong. And the pleasure will come along with it. Hopefully a slave, but at least bare minimum a companion. You should never be our mistress. In evolution, she's always our mistress. She leads the way. Whatever it touches... Disorientation touches. Now, since we're now once again living in Egypt, why are we so surprised to find this very same evolution-based system in full sway with similar results, with our culture growing ever more and more filthy as the years go by? We have all kinds of little sayings. Just do it. Follow your instincts. Fulfill your urges. There's nothing wrong. If it feels good, do it. Here then is the leopard experienced by Dante. It seeks to block our every attempt to climb the mountain using pictures, billboards, magazines, movies, commercials, internet, iPods, iPhones, and it goes on and on and on. And wherever we turn our face, there it is, assaulting us. 
Even the law of the land is forcing this filth upon us ever more and more. But it does not end there. This is the scariest part. But it initiates man into a terrible trajectory of sin. This is why the devil likes to start with the sixth commandment. So once man breaks with God and indulges the passions, he starts down a trajectory of sin that leads to violence and destruction. Now, we hear this trajectory in the letter of St. James. He says, this is chapter 1, verse 14. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. There it is. There it is. That's the mistress. She wants us to feel good. Follow me. Once again, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. End quote. St. James. Now, the pattern of trajectory is very plain. First, passions and desires arise. Number two, these are indulged by acting on them. This is mortal sin. Three, death of some kind inevitably follows. Spiritual death first, oftentimes physical death second. Now, let's go to another view of this. This is from the evil-minded Marquis de Sade. He lived during the French Revolution. You know the Marquis de Sade. That's where we get the word sadism from. and sadistic. There's a reason why those words come from this man. Because he captured this same trait of our fallen nature in a four-stage trajectory. According to him, it begins with simple passions. Simple passions, you know, things that feel good. Very, you know, there's nothing wrong with these things. But then it's followed by complex passions. Pretty soon you're kind of angry. Having a hard time with things. Controlling yourself. Then it's followed by criminal passions. You start one to lash out. Then it's followed by murderous passions. Now he figured this out by observation and experience during the French Revolution. So when simple passions, fleshly passions, are used outside the moral order, outside the matrix of life and love, as pleasures decline, and soon they lead to complex passions, anger and frustration... Then they lead to criminal passions, acts of violence, and finally to murderous passions. Now, this trajectory is obvious in the Bible in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, as well as in the story of David and Bathsheba. And it it ended in death. It is represented in our modern movies, most especially in the category of horror. In almost every horror movie, it seems that there are various scenes showing violations of Sixth and Ninth Commandments, followed up by frightening and disgusting violations of the Fifth Commandment. You know it's true if you've seen them. Every single horror movie has those violations of the Sixth and Ninth Commandments. What's going on there? Well, it's as if the movie producers are saying, when we unleash the marital act of life and love from its God-given place in marriage, we unleash terrible monsters. Death and destruction upon the world. So it's a proven fact that hardened criminals and mass murderers and concentration camp leaders and torturers were first desensitized in this area. through various violations of the Sixth Commandment, starting with self-abuse. They had to abuse themselves before they could abuse others. Now, if you look on the web, look under FBI, serial killer profile, it'll tell you this stuff. It's there. It's things they do when they were kids. This is true of the Satanists as well. They have to be desensitized in this area first before they can do what their diabolical religion requires of them. Now, let me give an example. Let's go back to the 19th century, Blessed Bartolo de Longo. Before his reversion to the faith and building that beautiful shrine in Pompeii, Italy, he was looking to a medium, a witch, to answer his questions that he had. He was struggling with some questions. So he asked the witch, Is Jesus Christ God and a medium? She was a medium. A devil spoke through her. Yes, Jesus Christ is God. Then he said, Well... 
Are the precepts of the Ten Commandments true? Oh, yes, they're true, except the sixth. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Now, this is where the devil likes to start. So after some time of dabbling in the occult himself and sinning, Bartolo began to commit, contemplate suicide. See how that trajectory? Sixth commandment. Simple passions, complex passions, criminal passions, murderous passions. He's going to kill himself. Another example. The 19-year-old Alexander Saranelli, he killed 11-year-old St. Maria Goretti due to desires connected to the Sixth and Ninth Commandment. He later explained that he found himself in a sort of animal rage he could neither control or understand. Murderous passions overcame him. And we know the rest of the story. When Stalin, hmm, Stalin was studying for the Orthodox priesthood, he read Darwin's books and concluded, they've lied to us, there is no God. And as we know, he left the seminary and he became one of the world's worst tyrants, killing somewhere around 60 million people. Just before he died, he was planning on unleashing a new world war using nuclear weapons, documented fact. In case, if you're not aware, communism is a system very much based on historical political progress. It's based on evolution. Mao Zedong, the Chinese tyrant, used evolution as the first step in educating his people. How many people did he kill? Over 100 million. In our times, evolutionary thinking has unleashed incredible violence under the fifth commandment, such as embryonic research, cloning, abortion, eugenics, and human experimentation. It should not surprise us to find this described by God himself in the scriptures. Psalm 13, you can meditate on it. It says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So he's breaking the first commandment. There's no God. Throw out the first commandments. No first tablet. Then it says, they are corrupt and are become abominable in their ways. The sixth commandment, we'll indulge whatever we want. Unnatural vice. Then their feet are swift to shed blood. Fifth commandment, first, sixth, fifth. Destruction and unhappiness in their ways and their way of peace they have not known. There is no fear before their eyes. They devour my people as they eat bread. They have not called upon the Lord. They devour my people as if they were eating bread. Stalin, 60 million. Mao, 100 million. How many have we killed through abortion? Scriptures also describe those who embrace an evolutionary-based system. This is Psalm 48. You can meditate on this. Man has been compared to senseless beasts. And made like them, he shall never see light. So you're going to compare yourself to beasts? Go become one. That's what God is saying. And he shall never see light. People who embrace the evolutionary systems that are all around us run a great risk of inevitably losing their true faith. After Moses came down, many refused to repent. And they were put to the sword and sent to the pit below. Never to see light. How many were they? 23,000 men. They're like the beasts that are destroyed. St. Paul says in Galatians, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For what things a man shall sow, those also shall he reap. For he that soweth in the flesh, of the flesh also shall reap corruption. Alas, Father, enough. What can we do? Well, we need to get oriented again. We must look up to God to provide the solutions. Now, Moses looked up and after a time, his face began to glow. To counter the leopard, that is the multiple violations of the sixth commandment all around us, we're taught to be modest. Speaking of the 20th century by name, way back in 1610, Our Lady of Good Success said the Sister Marianne of Jesus, In these unhappy times of the 20th century, innocence will almost no longer be found in children, nor modesty in women. And in this supreme moment of need, the church 
in this supreme moment of need, the church, those to whom it behooves to speak, will fall silent. You won't hear about modesty anymore. Our Lady of Fatima said, certain fashions will be introduced that will offend my son very much. So innocence won't be found in children. I think that's come true. Modesty in women's not found. I think that's true. When you go to the store today, you're like, oh, okay, put the blinders on. So let's be watchful then over ourselves and over our children, keeping our passions free from impurity, which is the source of great evils and restlessness. We can do this by seeking to be modest in all our ways, not just in our dress. Modesty is more than just how we dress. Listen to St. Paul. But fornication and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is fitting among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor silly talk, nor levity, which are not fitting, but instead let there be thanksgiving. So let's don't even talk about that stuff. Don't let that stuff pass your lips. St. Peter says, Beloved, be eager to be found without spot or blemish before him. St. Jude says, Hate even the garment spotted by the flesh. And here's a powerful one. Pope Pius XII. Now, I'm going to interject a little commentary as I read along. Okay, you ready? Pope Pius XII. Quote, Modesty foresees threatening danger. Modesty foresees threatening danger. Forbids us to expose ourselves to risks. Demands the avoidance of those occasions which the imprudent do not shun. Like what? Like immodest movies, TV, books, dating, magazines. He goes on. It does not like impure or loose talk. It shrinks from the slightest immodity. Even one commercial, one movie scene is too much for modesty. Don't say to yourself, well, someone will just have to pass forward through that little section. No. Modesty hates that. It runs from it. Listen to Pope Pius XII. It carefully avoids suspect familiarity with persons of the other sex since it brings the soul to show due reverence to the body as being a member of Christ and the temple of the Holy Spirit. He who possesses the treasure of Christian modesty abominates every sin of impurity and instantly flees whenever he is tempted by its seductions. Let me repeat that. He who possesses the treasure of Christian modesty abominates every sin of impurity and instantly flees wherever he is tempted by its seductions. One commercial is too much. One scene is too much. One magazine article is too much. One magazine picture is too much. Get it out of your life. It's Jericho. Now, not long after Fatima, our Lord told Blessed Alexandrina, vanity and extravagance in the world must cease. Let those exhibiting their bodies clothe themselves. Let modesty reign. Penance, prayer, much prayer is needed. Okay, so I recommend everywhere I go that the TV needs to go. I know it's hard, but I'm telling you, this is the way up the mountain. Take it outside, smash it, burn it, and put some holy water on it. That would be a good start. And then go through your house and go through all your music and clothing and burn all that is immodest. You can tell music that's immodest just by the cover. Almost inevitably, it's got somebody immodest on it. I've even seen Christian music with immodest singers on the front. That's what it's good for. We've got to stop flirting with Egypt and Jericho. It's just too darn dangerous. Now, what about the line of pride and self-determination? The answer is to keep our Sunday obligation with all that it encompasses. The commandments on the first tablet are all encapsulated in our Sunday obligation. 
Of all the things God gave Moses on the mountain when he was up there, he repeated himself on observing the Sabbath. In fact, there are several kinds of Sabbaths mentioned. There's the weekly Sabbath. There's a seven-year Sabbath. There's a jubilee Sabbath. That's every 49 years. Now, what is more, God's repetition of the weekly Sabbath came just before he sent Moses down the mountain. It's as if he were saying, the antidote to what you're going to find down there is the proper observance of the Sabbath. That's what he was saying. Do this and you'll avoid what's going on down there. So we should not be surprised to find the Sabbath as the centerpiece of the Mosaic law. That's why they, the, the Jews at the time of Jesus were so frustrated with Jesus because they felt like he was overturning the centerpiece of their law, which was the Sabbath. The ancient Hebrews and the fathers of the church understood the Sabbath to be the goal of all creation. What is that? To rest with God. Not passions and motions, but to be still. To know that I am God. To rest with God. Not working on Sunday, therefore, stands for more than just nitpicking ritual. It's a way of imitating God and combating the passions stirred up by Jericho and Egypt. This also touches directly on why our Lord healed so often on the Sabbath. Because it prefigures the wholeness that's available. The peace of heaven where we rest with God eternally. No evolutionary passion-based systems are in heaven. So the Sabbath rest is something sacred because it's man's way of withdrawing from the sometimes excessively demanding cycle of this world to renew our awareness that everything is a work of God. We can forget that God is the creator when we have all this stuff. He's going to remind us that he's the creator pretty soon. We'll talk about that later this week. Now, when someone does not want to be with God on Sunday, I like to say, what does that mean? I don't want to go to Mass on Sunday. You don't want to be with God in heaven. Don't want to go to Mass on Sunday? Don't want to be with God in heaven. They'll go together. They always go together. You don't want to rest with God on Sunday? I don't want to be with God in heaven. That's why it's a mortal sin to miss Mass on Sunday. It will block your way to heaven. So observing our Sunday obligation, therefore, is practicing for heaven. It's an antidote to this evolutionary nonsense that's going on in the world today. So furthermore, it is clear that Sunday runs directly counter to this evolutionary spirit, this smog in the valley. Although there are different forms of evolution out there, they all, no matter who they are, like these theistic evolutionists, They all deny the primordial establishment of the Sabbath as something created by God in the beginning. This view contradicts the obvious sense of Scripture. It contradicts the universal belief of the church fathers in the divine institution of the Sabbath on the seventh day and the seven-day week in the beginning of creation. They're denying this. They're saying it took millions of years and God finally said, okay, now let there be seven days And let this one be like this. No, no. This is how it began. Recall that our Lord said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Now, implicit in these words is the idea that the Sabbath was made by God for man, not just the Hebrews. And therefore, it's from the beginning when God made man. And that man means it needs rest with God to be with him in heaven. So observance of the Sabbath also includes that in the beginning, it indicates that in the beginning, God created a perfect universe. As the scriptures say, he hath made nothing defective. This is very important. I know this is a long conference, but it means that in the beginning, it was perfect. That's why God rested. But due to sin, creation fell. Thus, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, Adam was going down to Jericho from Jerusalem. He wasn't going up, which evolution would have us believe. It took him thousands and thousands and hundreds and thousands of years to finally get to the point where he could be a man and make his way up the mountain. No, he was going down. 
Evolution would have us believe that many centuries upon centuries of painful mutations were required to reach a state in which man could enter the world. Does this sound like something our God would do? Death and destruction and mutation? Once again, he hath made nothing defective. Again, wisdom reacheth from end to end mightily and ordereth all things sweetly. Wisdom, chapter 8. Is this painful series of mutations something sweetly ordered by God? Does that sound sweet to you? All these mutations and death and destruction? It also says in wisdom, God did not make death and destruction. Wisdom 1.13. Now, since evolution is inimical to the Sabbath, it's inimical. They're the contrary. We should not be surprised to find revolutionary men attempting to eliminate its existence. This is why Russia became the land without a Sunday. Maybe you've read that book. The land without a Sunday because they attempted to change the length of the week to various things like six or eight or ten with a day off. But there was no Sunday rest. Now, now, let me see now. How many people died in Russia under Stalin alone? Sixty million. Take away the Sundays? What are you going to get? In communist China under Mao Zedong in the late 1960s, there was a cultural revolution where Mao tried to wipe out nearly all forms of recreation and entertainment. Books, plays, operas, parks, art, etc. After a few years, the results were disastrous. People were suffering from a multitude of mental illnesses and the incidences of face twitches and nervous behavior were a common daily sight among the people. No Sunday rest allowed. Oh, yeah, now how many did Mao take out? 100 million. I hope you see how powerful, important Sunday is. It's the antidote. Let us then be counter, counter, revolu- or cultural and counter revolutionaries by fully embracing our Sunday obligations. Sunday is not just a day off, but a time to rest with God. First and foremost, by giving the whole day over to Him. And not just mere attendance at Holy Mass. It's the Lord's day, not just the Lord's hour. What should we do? We could go for a walk, go for a hike. We can enjoy God's creation. He rested on the seventh day when He was creating, so we should rest and enjoy His creation. We should read good books, Lives of the Saints. These are meritorious. We should study something new about God and His creation. These are all meritorious. We can recreate with the family or do something by meeting somebody who needs our company. We can make a pilgrimage. We can sing Catholic hymns and songs and play games and so on. Refuse to do any work that you could do on some other day of the week. Sunday's not a day to clean. Sunday's not a day to mow the lawn. It's also not a day to shop. This makes others miss Mass and their chance to rest on Sunday too. Once again... It is the day where we renew our awareness that everything is a work of God and that all depends on Him. So one last thing I want to tell you that's a counter-revolutionary, counter-evolutionary point. And it's very important. And it's not that long. The Israelites most likely failed down in the valley because they did not yet have the Ark. The Ark of the Covenant. This is the same as saying they did not have a devotion to the Blessed Mother of God. Once they had the ark, they conquered all their foes, all the way to the promised land. Everybody in their way was mowed down because they had the ark. Now, some tried to go to the promised land. You can read about it in Numbers. They tried to go to the promised land without the ark and without Moses. What happened to them? They died. They were scattered. They didn't make it. They were killed. How important is the ark? So in regards to evolution, a year before Darwin published his Origin of Species, Our Lady said to St. Bernadette at Lourdes, you know it, I am the Immaculate Conception. Pope Pius IX said a few, four years earlier, the church made it clear that the conception of Mary is something extraordinary different from the conception of all other human beings. Thank you, Pope Pius IX. So there's only one immaculate conception. 
If Adam were conceived in the womb of an ape, God forbid, that's so silly, then he too would have been immaculately conceived since the original sin had not yet been committed. You get it? But this cannot be unless all that has been since transpired, all that has taken place at Lord's is false. All this shows that devotion to Our Lady will keep us free from the errors of Jericho. She will help us learn to be still and know God. What we've learned tonight. Let's review. One, sin is the greatest evil in the world. Ask God to keep you from sinning in the future that you may grasp, that you may understand something of its evil so as to truly hate sin and to do penance and reparation for all your past sins. Number two, we must look up to the church and all her teachings in order to overcome the various moral dilemmas in this world and to keep our focus on heaven. Number three, The natural law is summarized by the Ten Commandments and they are listed in order of importance. We can say, therefore, that people who do not take the worship of God seriously, in other words, obeying the first three commandments, all of which are captured and practiced in our devout observance of Sunday obligations, easily fall into all sorts of sins of the flesh and other temptations, all of them usually of the fourth and the Ten Commandments. This leads them down a trajectory of sin that will eventually cause much suffering, violence, and death. But if we keep our worship in God in place, He will keep us free from the lion and the leopard and the wolf. Number four. Evolution is a philosophical belief of revolutionary men based on man's passions. It's pseudoscience to justify an end. It attacks nearly everything we believe and those who embrace it, even just a little, usually end up compromising or losing their faith. Wherever it goes, it causes disorientation. Number five, attending Sunday Mass and observing a Sunday rest is practicing for heaven. People who do this rarely become criminals or commit grave sins listed on the second tablet. Finally, devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, immaculate in her conception, will protect us from these evils. Let us renew our efforts in climbing the mountain of God. Let us make a sweep of our homes. Find Jericho. Find the smog. It's there. I know you can't get it all rid of it at once, but start. For those who keep climbing, God will shine his face upon them and they will so they will become a source of peace for the world and their faces will glow as did the face of Moses. Thank you for listening to this long talk.